our call to worship. To whom do we turn? We turn to the Lord. To whom do we listen? We listen to the Lord. Come then, let us worship the Lord. Let us come before the Lord now in stillness. The Lord has words for the weary, encouragement for those who struggle and comfort for our souls. Let us gather as disciples, awaiting our Lord, our leader. Amen. We join in singing the hymn 436, What shall I do, my, <clears throat> my God to love? Let us all pray. You are righteous and gracious, O God, slow to anger and merciful. You do not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our evil ways. You answer our ingratitude with kindness. Your love for us never fails. You deserve praise without ceasing and adoration forever. All glory and honour and blessing be yours, world without end. Amen. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament 
proclaims his handiwork. Heavenly God, we praise and adore you. We lift our hearts to you, for you are our all. We see you in the landscape, in the sky, in the hills and trees, the mountains and streams. We see you in the face of the child looking up in love, on the face of elderly people sleeping in peace. We see the clouds of glory, Lord, on which you come in power. We hear the rumble as the stone rolls from the tomb. We feel the earth shake as your will is done on the cross. Our hearts still as the storm ceases on the Sea of Galilee. Messiah, Son of Man, Cosmic Christ, Lord of time and space and realms beyond our imagining, we praise and adore you for your divinity in all dimensions. Yet we remember the babe born as one of us, who walked among us in all our suffering, and who is still with us, man and Messiah, the hope of the world beyond our wildest dreams. Lord, you walk with your disciples from village to village, and on the way you talk to them about many things. Some things were not easy to hear or to understand. We meet you here today, Lord, to hear these things too. You don't call us to sit doing nothing. You want us to be on the move, taking risks to change our world and save our lives. Help us then to draw close to you, to be ready to listen, then to act. God of grace and glory, we give you thanks that you have revealed your power and splendor through your mighty acts of creation and shown your redeeming and transforming love through your beloved Son. Let us give thanks to God with our whole heart. Before all others, let us sing God's praise. We come to this place of worship to offer thanks for God's steadfast love and faithfulness to us. We exalt God's name and honour God's word. For when we call, God answers us and strengthens our soul. Your glory shines forth from the highest heaven, and yet you have compassion on the lowly. Great is your glory, and your steadfast love endures forever. Let all the people praise your holy name. Amen. And now we're to hear our readings from the Old Testament. First, the lecturing lesson from Isaiah. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 to 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of one who has been instructed to console the weary with a timely word. He made my hearing sharp every morning that I might listen like one under instruction. The Lord God opened my ears and I did not disobey or turn back in defiance. I offered my back to the lash, 
and let my beard be plucked from my chin. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. But the Lord God is my helper, therefore no insult can wound me. I know that I shall not be put to shame, therefore I have set my face like a flint. One who will clear my name is at my side. Who dare argue against me? Let us confront one another. Who will dispute my cause? Let him come forward. The Lord God is my helper. Who then can declare me guilty? They will all wear out like a garment. The moth will devour them. Amen. And as this is Education Sunday, I have chosen a reading from Proverbs. The first four chapters of the book of Proverbs are all about wisdom. You'll be pleased I don't intend to read all four chapters. But I'll read part from the first chapter. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. But since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calam calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distre distress and trouble overwhelm you. Then they will call to me but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Amen. We join in singing the hymn 322. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear.
And now let us all pray a prayer of confession. Merciful God, your Son has taught us that there is more joy in heaven over one penitent sinner than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. We sinners repent of our sins. We confess the wrong words we have spoken. With the same tongues that have blessed your name, we have spoken often of ill of those who are made in your likeness. We confess the wrong thoughts we have entertained. We have despised and judged our brothers and sisters and be, been slow to forgive their behavior. We confess the wrong deeds we have done. We have often worshipped the idols of wealth and power and acted unjustly and selfishly. We sinners repent of our sins. Lord, we are often ashamed to confess our faith. We clutch it to ourselves as a guilty secret. If we speak of it, we make apology. What will people think of us? Will we be ridiculed, despised? So we remain silent in this free country. Yet across the world, people suffer for their faith. They profess, confess, and bear the consequences. We confess our cowardice and shame that we show at times and ask for your forgiveness in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord who came into the world to save sinners and we ask for forgiveness in his name. Lord Jesus Christ, you are Messiah. We take up our cross and follow. Amen. And now we hear the lectionary reading for today from Mark's Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? They answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others one of the prophets. And you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. Then he gave them strict orders not to tell anyone about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man had to endure great suffering and to be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, to be put to death and to rise again three days afterwards. He spoke about it plainly. At this, Peter took hold of him and began to rebuke him. But Jesus, turning and looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter. Out of my sight, Satan, he said. You think as men think, not as God thinks. Then he called the people to him, as well as the disciples, and said to them, Anyone who wants to be a follower of mine must renounce self. He must take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. What does anyone gain by winning the whole world at the cost of his life? What can he give to buy his life back? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this wicked and godless age, 
the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Amen. Thank you, and, <clears throat> and to David for sharing in the reading of the lessons. We sing a hymn which is not in the hymn books, entitled, Who is this man? And it comes from New Zealand to the tune of Londonderry Air.
Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 27. Who do people say that I am? As Jesus is walking with his disciples, he suddenly asks them this question. Who do people say that I am? And their reply came back. Some say they are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Whoever the people thought Jesus was, it is obvious that they considered him to be an outstanding man and that he must have made a deep impression on the popular mind of the people. Among those who thought that Jesus was John the Baptist risen from the dead was Herod, the man who had had John beheaded. When he heard of Jesus' wonderful works, as we read in the 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Herod told the people around him that he believed this man Jesus to be the risen John the Baptist. Perhaps that was bad conscience on the part of Herod. And there, there was a reason why some people believed that Jesus was Elijah or Jeremiah. The fact was that these people, these two, were thought to have been removed from the earth without actually dying and that they would reappear as the herald of the expected Messiah. And then Jesus asked a more important question. But who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking for all of them, cries, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. When the disciples first met Jesus, they thought that he must be the Messiah. Since then, however, he has never called himself the Christ and certainly not behaved like the Messiah of their expectations, a prince of David's house who would overwhelm the Romans and found a splendid political kingdom over which he would rule in righteousness. But month by month they have lived with him. They have felt his superhuman authority and wondered at his superhuman goodness. And slowly they have come to the conclusion that their first thoughts about Jesus must be right. That Jesus must be the Christ. Even though for some strange reason he has not yet declared himself. When the great confession is made, you are the Christ, Jesus immediately instructs them not to reveal the secret. He requires them to remain silent. Between now and Calvary, he must teach them and make them understand that by suffering and death, he must establish the rule of God over people and become their divine saviour. Jesus asked what people said about him then. What have people said about Jesus since? Jesus has been the most written about person that has ever lived. People have expressed views about him, both favourable and unfavourable. The soldier who stood by the side of the cross when Jesus died was so struck with the personality of Jesus and the way he died that he exclaimed, truly, this was the Son of God. And that was the first statement about Jesus 
after his death. In the hymn that we sang earlier, just look at the names we claim for Jesus as we sang that hymn. Dear name, the rock on which I build, my shield and hiding place, my never failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. Jesus, my shepherd, brother, friend, my prophet, priest and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Wow. If we really meant that when we sang those words, what a claim we made for Jesus this morning. Jesus as shepherd, Lord and King are three of the names <coughs> by which he is known most and used quite often. Saviour of the world was a claim made after his death and resurrection. But all those are favourable things that are said about Jesus. Let us look at some of the unfavourable things that have been said. Some people have said that Jesus was just a good man who lived a good life, but he was certainly not the Son of God. There are those who have said and say today that Christianity is a lot of nonsense. They don't believe that Jesus even existed. Historical facts and records have proved that a man named Jesus did live around 2,000 years ago who went around teaching, performing miracles. Even Muslims acknowledge him and honour him as a prophet. There are those who even dare say that he was an imposter who faked his death so that his followers could claim that he had risen. What about people today? Who do they say Jesus is today? Now, if we were to go into Wakefield today, into the city centre, and ask people that we met, did they know who Jesus was? We would certainly get a variety of answers to our questions. We would probably hear answers like this. <clears throat> I don't know. He is the person whose birthday we celebrate Christmas. That's if we're lucky. He is something to do with Christianity and the church. A man who was put on a cross. A swear word. Only a small minority would be able to say much more than that. Those who knew Jesus as saviour, guide and friend. And we have to face the fact that the majority of our fellow men and women in this country of ours, and in the world in general, are not really concerned as to whether Jesus lived or not. As long as they're able to have a good time at Christmas and have a holiday from work at Easter, then they are satisfied. In the reading from Isaiah chapter 50, the, this is in the middle of 2nd Isaiah's wonderful poem of rescue and homecoming. Here the prophet seeks to sustain the weary Judeans exiled in Babylon with a word. He has the tongue of a teacher, but to do this he needs the ear an attitude of one who is taught. The 6th century BC prophet is a disciple of the 8th century 1st Isaiah, as well as a disciple of God. It is only by being a disciple and a listener that it is possible to speak God's word. Delivering this message is costly and unsuccessful. 
The attackers might be members of the prophet's own community opposed to his message. But he is sure of vindication. He is certain that God will help him and any opposition will wear out like an old garment. Listen again to some words from the, our reading from the book of Proverbs. It begins like this. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? And it ends this way. The waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Today we are told that wisdom ignored leads to death and that wisdom heeded leads to life. It is something that many folk, many people do not care to hear. They do not to care to hear it because it is always the human desire to do what we want to do without having to suffer negative consequences. Many people believe that with regard to the promises of God, that it is enough to say, I believe, and attend, attend church now and then, in order to receive the rich inheritance that God has said he will give to us. But it is not so. God calls us to listen to him and to follow in his way, to live by his wisdom and his promise is that when we do this, then we will find what we seek and enjoy the fullness of what a relationship with the creator of the world is meant to bestow upon us. So what is the wisdom of God like? The wisdom that leads to life. Well, the scriptural record is clear about it. The wisdom of God is foolishness in the eyes of men and women. It seems foolish because it goes against our natural tendencies, because it reverses all that the world teaches us as being wise. The wisdom of God teaches that we must give up ourselves if we are to find ourselves, that we must acknowledge our weakness if we are to become strong, that we must surrender ourselves if we are to live. The gospel today puts this in the starkest terms possible. After Peter's answer to Jesus, you are the Christ. Jesus told Peter and the disciples for the first time that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law. And then he must be killed and after three days rise again. As we heard in the lesson, as we know, Peter protests against this teaching. He takes Jesus on one side and begins to rebuke him. And we can imagine, can't we, what he might have been trying to say to Jesus before Jesus cuts him off. Not you, Lord. You are good. No one would kill you. Stop thinking negatively. You'll be okay. It's not right to say that one who is meant to save Israel will be rejected by his own people. You are meant to save us from bondage, not to suffer and die. 
But Jesus turns this all around and he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then he calls the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses, loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes into his Father's glory with the holy angels. It is hard stuff to hear, is it not? Hard stuff to deal with, especially when we are so often a people who keep our faith to ourselves for fear of ridicule, especially when we are so often a people and among a people who work day and night to build our homes and our futures and who judge the success of a matter by how much pleasure or how much profit it affords us. How much do we set our mind on human things rather than the divine? The way of divine things does not appear to be an easy road. It holds some mystery. The human part of us does not want to deal with the hard stuff. We don't want to deal with talk of mortality, of suffering, of sacrifice and of death, even when there is attached to it the talk of resurrection and eternal life. Hard or not, Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, to de deny our fear and weakness and our pettiness and to pick up our cross of faith and to follow him. He asks us to lose our lives, to give up our own little restricted imaginations in order to embrace the larger vision of God's plan, of God's will. It is fair to say that most of us are not called upon to suffer and die for what we do in Christ's name today. While in some parts of the world, people are being killed because of their faith in Christ, because of their belief in the liberating word of God. Most of us are not asked, are not called upon to make this sacrifice. So what does denying ourselves and taking up our crosses and following Jesus entail for us? Well, it, it involves primarily how and why we make our daily choices. It involves whether or not we choose things on the basis of what is convenient and easy and self-serving or on the basis of what is right and good and loving. It is so easy for us to slip into the way of the world, into the ways of those who walk in darkness. No lights flash when you are in a situation when you must choose Christ or yourself. No bells ring when you are faced with judging someone or loving them. It's easy to go along with what others are saying or to let it go by for the sake of their so-called friendship. It is easy to choose to save your own life. All you have to do is to go with the flow. The way of the cross is by, lion, by and large much harder 
for it is a way that contradicts the easy way of the world, a way that earns you the hatred of those who are evil and brings you the hostility of those who do not like the light to be shined upon their acts. The way of choosing to deny oneself is difficult because our self is reluctant to die, reluctant to allow God to work in and through us, reluctant to trust that God can and will work a wonderful work when we follow in his path. This is the cross that most of us are called to carry each and every day. This is for most of us what is involved in denying oneself and choosing to follow the master. To give up our own opinions, our own selves, and if need be, our friends, for the sake of caring for God's children, both young and old, that others judge, despise, and reject. To be in a situation where we must choose either to follow Christ's example or not. The Christ who was rejected because he was good to prostitutes and tax collectors and other sinners and outcasts. Well, that can be hard at times. Denying oneself and picking up the cross and following Jesus is not about being the kind of martyr who was burned at the stake or fed to the lions by the Romans. No, it's about being the kind of witness who strives to forget about his or her own opinion of who is bad and who is good and instead strives to treat all people with love. It's about being the kind of witness who risks the disapproval of his or her friends because he or she will not listen to their judgment but instead seeks to bless those who have been criticised. It's about giving to strangers and to people of different backgrounds and different coloured skin and who speak a different language the same kind of love you give to your mates or members of the church choir or the church ladies group. It's about choosing to follow Jesus, knowing you have to forget yourself and what is easiest for you and remember instead what is the good and true and loving thing to do. In order for you to take up your cross, what in your life would have to change? What are you most afraid of losing? For many of us, it is what we might call our comfort zone, our comfort margin. Throughout the scriptures, we hear stories of what God is like and how God operates in our lives. All of them point to the need for us to have a radical trust in him, to give up our strength in favour of his. What, we, what might we lose if we are to be let it known that we value the ways of God over the ways of man? What might we have to give up if we are to actually live according to the vows we have made to God? You may have heard the story of Blondini, the man who walked across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And then he wheeled a wheelbarrow across the tightrope. And then he turned to the crowd who cheered him and said, do you believe that I could wheel a man across in the wheelbarrow? And they said, yes. And he said, right then, get in the wheelbarrow. And nobody did. And that is the same reaction with many people when it comes to commitment 
to the way of Christ. So Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And he got an answer. Then he asked another question, who do you say that I am? And it is the second question that is the most important one for us. Who do we say that Jesus is? What does Jesus mean to us? May we say with Peter, you are the Christ. You are my Lord and I will follow you and serve you to my life's end. Amen. We sing the hymn 563, 563, O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. of intercession. Firstly, a prayer for Education Sunday. Loving Lord, we think of the children and young people close to our hearts and know that they are precious in your sight, fearfully and wonderfully made. And so we place them into your hands today. Strengthen, strengthen and nurture them be with them in their coming in and going out, at home, at school, at college, at university, in their sports, activities and clubs, their friendships and their quiet times. Mold them in your image, forming and reforming, through the positive influence of those whose lives cross theirs through the love and example of those who care for them, and through the constant love of your Son Jesus, who walks alongside them each step of their lives, known or unknown. And we pray for teachers, lecturers, and administration staff, and all who have influence over young people's lives. And now, our general prayers of intercession. And after the words, how great a forest, will you respond with the, word, with, with the words, is set ablaze by a small fire. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. Lord, we pray for your church worldwide. For those in the church, the body of Christ, 
that the many denominations might be as one, that we may respect and learn from one another. For those who witness to their faith in places where it is difficult to be a Christian, in places where they are persecuted for their faith. We pray for your people here today, worshipping and sharing life together. May our life together reflect your love in this community and out into the world. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. We pray for your world, broken and needing to hear the whisper of your wisdom. Raise up men and women of integrity who will call out in the marketplace of our lives your wisdom for our hurting world. How great a forest is set ablaze as a full fire. We praise for those who live locally in this city, in this community, for schools that they may be places of wisdom, for community areas, that your wisdom may guide all those who control them, for our shops and industries, that relationships may be wisely maintained and fed. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. We pray for those who need your love at this time, the sick, the homeless, the housebound, the dying. May your loving hand hold them in their time of need and your wisdom calm the troubled mind. We praise, we pray for those in Haiti who were affected by the recent earthquake, for those living in Afghanistan who have gone through upheaval recently and who are living in fear. We pray for those who are still mourning and affected by the disaster of 9-11 in New York 20 years ago. We pray for those who mourn and those who mourn who are known to us. We pray for refugees, for all who stand in need and those who work in the name of Christ alongside them. May your love and peace surround and uphold them. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. Lord, we bring you ourselves. May we become wiser every day. May we note your voice and attend to it. May we act your love in the world. May we leave your joy and peace in our wake. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. May our lives be part of that growing fire, for we ask it in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is the hymn 348. He is Lord. He is Lord. Ooh. <laughs>
cross into the world. But remember, it is not yours, but the cross of Christ. And therefore we say, we shall not be ashamed, but gladly walk in the way of our Lord. And we say the words of the grace over one another. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. Amen.